Thank you. Thank you. Who will be next? Okay. <laughs> Amber Alexander with the Department of Finance. The governor's budget provides $100 million in one-time Proposition 98 funds to assist school districts in enhancing their internet connectivity. This builds upon the $26.7 million that was provided in the 2014 Budget Act for this same purpose. In addition, the governor's budget allocates an additional $8.8 .8 million from the K-12 High-Speed Networks Reserve Account to put forward for additional grants, bringing the total to about $108.8 .8 million. Priority for the grants, as we've, have, as we've heard, will continue to be, first, sites that are unable to administer computer-based assessments on site, and then second, sites that have to shut down other essential activities in order to be able to do so. These priorities recognize that California is currently in the process of transitioning to a new statewide assessment system, as we heard in the previous item, and many of the assessments that were previously paper pencil are now transitioning to computer-based. In an effort to ensure that the connectivity solutions that are implemented with the grant dollars are cost effective, the budget bill continues to require that the high speed network do a cost benefit analysis when allocating funds, specifically that the first priority be for sites that can't administer the test and that will um, experience the greatest benefit in terms of the number of students able to be assessed with the grant funding. Statute also required in the first round and will continue to require in, in this additional round that um, the high-speed network report to finance and the legislature upon final distribution of the grants, summarizing the projects that were funded. Finally, as the department pointed out, um, the high-speed network convened a technical peer review process as part of the grant award process. And that process um, was convened of uh, chief technology officers from around the state who reviewed the proposals to make sure that we were making wise investments. The governor's proposal continues to signal a commitment to bringing internet connectivity to schools. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Alexander. We'll move back now to Ms. Collins for the LAO's analysis of the governor's proposal. Thank you. Um, the Department of Finance described the governor's proposal for the second round of the broadband infrastructure improvement grants, but I'd like to provide a little bit more background on the other piece of this, which is the high-speed network's budget reserve. Um, if you turn to page five of the handout that uh, I spoke from earlier, the second checkbox describes the reserve um, and the fact that it's very large. Uh, in fact, it was over 100% last year. Um, and I think it's important to know, just for some context, that a school district of uh, similar expenditures has a median reserve of about 20%. So this is a large reserve, and we'll make recommendations um, pertaining to that. We begin our assessment of the governor's proposal, both the big grant and um, the reserve issue, on page six. So you have three options for addressing schools that are unable to take tests online or have difficulty administering them on site. They range from potentially very expensive to very inexpensive. Your first option uh, would be to build last mile connections using fiber optic cables. This would be the most expensive option because it would be uh, required that commercial providers go in and build fiber optic lines out to some of the most remote areas of the state, which can be quite costly. Um, to give some sort of perspective, uh, although this bid was not accepted by the HSN nor the CDE, um, there was one case where there were five test-taking students who were in the first round of big uh, broadband infrastructure improvement grants, there was a $10 million bid to, to build out to their school. Now, of course, this was unreasonable and the bid was not accepted. However, this gives you an idea of some of the costs that we may be faced with. Um, so this would be the, the most expensive option. The second option would be to, remain, to connect schools using different connectivity options, such as an airborne option. Um, such as satellite or microwave. Speeds would not be as fast as the fiber optic connection, but they would enable students to take the online tests, uh, and they would be far more cost effective because they don't require the type of um, trenching and building that the fiber optic option um, would require. 
HSN has indicated that it connect, could connect the existing 47 schools that have been identified um, as big schools using this option within the already allocated current year uh, big amount of 27 million. The last option um, would be to kind of maintain the status quo while we are transitioning to uh, computer-based tests required in 2018. It could be to test small numbers of students um, in order to not overload uh, internet bandwidth and reduce congestion. It could be to bus students to other locations such as county offices of education, which all have very fast speeds. Or it could be um, uh, requiring students to continue to take paper and pencil tests at these schools that have difficulty administering the online version. Moving to the second checkbox pertaining to the HSN budget reserve. Like the governor, we have concerns with the reserve and think that um, the state should consider how to move forward in oversight of the HSN. In order to um, ensure sufficient oversight, state law requires an annual audit of the high-speed network. However, this audit is currently embedded in an overall audit of the Imperial County Office of Education, which is the administering um, county for this grant. So we don't have specific financial information pertaining to this program. Page five describes our recommendations. First, we recommend that the legislature not fund extraordinary costs for internet to the, to the schools identified in the big process. We recommend using lower cost options that would still allow students to take the test online. In order to ensure a per, that per student costs are not unreasonable, we recommend that the legislature set a maximum per pupil amount that it's comfortable um, funding students to take the test at. We also recommend that the legislature suspend the budget appropriation for the high-speed network in 15-16. This differs from the governor's proposal because he proposes to put part of the budget reserve on top of the existing $100 million for a second round of big. We don't think this money is necessary, and we think it would be better spent reverting back to Prop 98 for other purposes. We also encourage the legislature to add more specific and explicit information requiring an annual audit of the HSN um, so we have better information about this program. Based on that information, we recommend reassessing the, the reserve that the HSN will keep as well as its ongoing allocations and appropriations um, through the budget process moving forward. With that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um Separating the financial information for HSN from the Imperial County Office, that seems like it would be a fairly doable task. How does the department feel about that? We're actually already underway with, um, we will be underway shortly, and I'm going to let Cindy answer that with that this year. Hi, good afternoon. Cindy Kazanis, Educational Data Management Division at the Department of Education. Um, we have asked the uh, Imperial County Office of Education to engage in a performance audit of the program, and we expect to have that this fall when we also uh, plan to meet with Department of Finance to discuss these reserves and the appropriate use of them moving forward. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, it seems to me that the microwave or satellite option is a reasonable option to provide students with equity and still to reduce the cost um, of the HSN reserve right now, and, and you've probably already mentioned this, but what would the total cost be of adopting microwave or satellite technology in the schools that don't have it now? They could cover it with the existing current year budget. Um, that is the proposal that, that we're, we're trying to and, and, evaluate and so, right now. So specifically, how much money would that cost just to do that? I don't have the information okay. handy about the 47 sites, um, but we are, as Monique explained, uh, for the 18 that we're moving forward, some of those are actually at a, a microwave solution. Death Valley is one example of that, which is about a million dollars to connect four sites. Okay. Um, so for the 47 sites, that if, if that were done this year, that would still leave, I assume, a large reserve in the HSN budget? Or am I incorrect with that? Well, under the governor's proposal, um, $8.8 .8 million of their reserve would be going towards a second round of grants. So their reserve would be approximately 5 uh, to $5.5 million. And of that amount, um, the K-12 HSN has indicated that that is enough for a six-month operational reserve for, um, for the organization. 
as well as um, setting aside approximately 2.5 million for purposes of equipment refresh, which occurs on a on a five year um, cycle. And even with that, the LAO feels the reserve is too much. Yes, we feel the reserve is excessive. And the governor doesn't support a budget cap for these reserves. Oh, I'm sorry. I may have some misspoke. Do you mean the 5.5 reserve um, that well, that the, would we would draw down the HSN under reserve, the, the total? We reserve. believe that the current reserve, without any further action, is excessive. In terms of whether it would be excessive if we went with the governor's proposal, which would be to spend it down to 5.5 million for the um, refresh and for the operational budget. We simply don't have the financial information in order to evaluate that reserve. That's why we recommend um, getting that information and then next year evaluating okay. what an appropriate reserve, reserve would be. And that would be the information that would be available with the Imperial County Audit? Okay. Correct. All right. Yeah. And we you. can that, evaluate that it. That clarifies things for me. Uh, Senator Allen? I just love to, uh, you know, it's, we talked about special ed this morning. Does anyone have any insights about some of the unique challenges associated with special ed as it relates to technology, uh, given the, the changes in assessments, um, all of the incredible tools that have been addressed and developed? Can, can someone just speak a little bit specifically to that challenge as it relates to uh, particularly those, well, in fact, it's, it's not even just a problem with those districts that have low, high-speed broadband access, but statewide. So I, I think we can get back to you about um, special education students and assessments and, and their use of technology and tools. Um, I don't think we have anyone here to speak about that today specifically. Because okay. I mean, as, as you know, there's it, it's becoming increasingly tech dependent as a field of pedagogy. Okay, and with that, I would like to, again, this is going to be held open pending the May revision. Um, we move to item number six, the April letters. Now, items one through 12 on the April letters, and invite up representatives of finance, education, and LAO in case there are questions that come up just for technical assistance here. Um, the... April letters one through 12, before we take a vote, these are vote only, um, and the recommendation um, is to approve letters one through 12. Any members of the public wish to address us on items one through 12, this is the opportunity. Come on up. One through 12? Yeah. Hello, my name is Grace Trujillo. I'm and a just to review the ground rules, you have up to one minute. Uh, orally, you can supply any additional written documentation you wish. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, my name is Grace Trujillo, and I have a son with special needs. In order for my son to be successful in the special education, he needs special ed funds along with the general fund. My son has gone from not being able to walk to be um, fully functioning, high functioning. One of the key things in my son is he has if major... If I, can, yeah, if I can interrupt you, I'm really sorry for this. We're now just talking about the April letters um, in the agenda uh, and items 1 through 12 of the April letters, not the previous agenda. I think you're speaking... Yeah, about. because I'm, I wasn't too sure exactly what you guys yeah. were talking about. Public comment from 1 to 6. Okay. Yeah. So, so this is just item 6, letters 1 through 12. I think you want to talk about... Item one in the overall agenda. Yes. And you'll have an opportunity to do that at the very when, end. Oh, at the, the end? Agenda. Oh, thank yeah. you. Well, so, I wasn't so, too sure because I didn't want to miss my turn either. Not your fault. Because <laughs> I, I waited almost two. I've been here since, I think, 9 o'clock. So I wanted to make sure I had, had my comments and I didn't want to miss and, it. And you will. And, and <laughs> I appreciate you. it. And I apologize for not being clear about that. So, so anybody who wants to speak to letters 1 to 12, tell us which letter it is you want to speak to and then you have your minute. Go ahead. Thank, thank you, Brad Strong with Children Now. It's item two of the April letters. Um, deals with the California Longitudinal uh, Pupil Achievement Data System. We, we support the finance letter and, and, and the revision. Um, but um, we wanted to flag that it does carry um, forward problematic language that has been adopted in the last three budgets. The language specifically, um, it conditions receipt of the funds and prohibits the State Department of Education from adding additional data elements to CalPADS or even enhancing the system beyond the data elements and functionalities. This language has gone into the last three budgets. It created a real problem um, last year, or the year, last year I believe it was, 
when we couldn't um, get transitional kindergarten. So we actually had no data. Uh, the Department of Education was unable to um, put in an ind indicator for transitional kindergarten students. For the first co year cohort, we couldn't even um, identify those. We think the language is problematic. It could be um, a, a much softer in terms of making sure there's agreement between the finance and the legislative office, legislative analyst office and Department of Education. Um, but we're just hoping that that language is not um, repeated again this year uh, in, in, and um, do, did want to flag it in this revision. We we'll appreciate, we'll appreciate Mr. your comments and staff is looking into that. Senator Allen, did you have something? Yeah, well, I just, just so I can understand the, um, the logistics of that. I mean, how, so what, what, so staff, what happens, staff works with them to, to examine this issue and then? And then we'll come up with the recommendation. Okay, all right, okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members, Bill Lucia with that voice, also on number two, the same issue. And uh, this specifically, there's ambiguity on the issue of the most current approved SPR or FSR. And that, that basically can shut out any, any smart improvement going forward. And the, the issue of transparency and data and the ability to do things while they're, the contractors are in, in progress, as far as computers are concerned, uh, it's ones and zeros and capacity and whatnot. It's, this is not a big, it's an issue of making a policy judgment call about whether this data is useful at the state level and for LEAs and to collect it by, particularly by subgroups of how kids are doing. So we strongly recommend revisiting this language as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, what we will do is hold open letter number two, pending further discussion between the folks who just addressed us and our consultant and uh, Mr. Allen's office, mine and Mr. Morlock's. Um, so we'll hold open item number two, hearing no discussion of item number one or items three through 12, we will now move to a vote. Um, a recommendation is approval of these letters. Ask staff to open the roll. Senator Block. Aye. Senator Allen. Aye. Senator Morlock. Okay, show items one and two through 12, letters being approved, two, zero, one abstention. Okay, yeah, one and three through 12 being approved, thank you, thank you. Now we move to letter number 13. Is there a discussion of 13? Ms. Ramos. Monique Ramos on behalf of the Department of Ed. So I think there, was the confusion that we caught this morning, and I just want to clarify, um, the report that we were funding in here is not a report that the department decided to do. It's a consolidation of three legislative required reports. So we would consolidate the career pathway trust required report, the linked learning report, and the graduation requirement report from um, a bill a few years ago. So we apologize about the late notice, um, but, but caught that late this morning. Yeah, I think with that one then too, along with item number two, we'll hold that open pending further discussion. Um, and with that, we are finished with item number six. Thank you and excuse this panel. Um, we move to item number seven, state operations. And on item seven, we will hear, I would assume first, is it finance first or education first? Finance? Okay, who do we have from finance? Thank you, Melissa Ng with the Department of Finance. Um, just to give a quick overview, and as the table shows, um, the governor's budget provides a total of $355.5 million for state operations support uh, to the Department of Education, $56.5 million in general fund, $156.2 million in federal fund, and $32.3 million in other funds support approximately 1,500 positions at the Department of Education. Additionally, $47.5 million in general fund, $52.6 a uh, million in Prop 98 general fund and 10.4 million other fund supports approximately 1,000 positions at the state special schools. Um, so for the specific adjustments in the governor's budget, I'll just give a very quick description. Um, since these issues span across uh, different assignment areas, I'll let my colleagues come up and answer any specific uh, questions you might have that I might not have an answer to. 
Um, so starting with the first item, the governor's budget provides one-time funding of $3.7 million to support the second year of a contract with the legal firm representing the Department of Ed, the State Board, and the Superintendent of Public Instruction in the Cruz versus uh, State of California lawsuit. Hello. Yep. Uh, we would suggest continuing to monitor these costs, but um, they, this is a lawsuit the state's engaged in and, and we are defending it. And the attorney general has recused herself from defending the state in this case. So the department um, had to contract out. So it looks like these are costs the state is facing, but um, the, the current year ha funding hasn't been fully drawn down. So we would just uh, recommend continuing to monitor it to make sure um, that we're providing the right amount. But at this point, I think we feel like it's a cost we have to do, so we'd recommend approval. Thank you. Sure. Um, the second item, the governor's budget is providing 250000 in one-time funding um, to meet the requirements of AB 1719 enacted last year, um, which requires an evaluation of full-day and part-day kindergarten programs from across the state um, and a report to be submitted to the legislature by July 1st, 2017. Elio? Uh, our review of this proposal suggested that um, this funding is sufficient to accomplish the activities outlined in the legislation. So we'd recommend approval. Thank you. And if education wants to jump in, you can. Don't need to. Thank you. So uh, so on this report, um, we are, we're still working with folks, but we do have some concerns about the amount. We feel that it may not be a sufficient study for what the bill had required, and we are still working with folks to try to work through that process. Thank you. Number three. Sure. The third item, the governor's budget is providing 107000 in ongoing funding for one existing position uh, to address increased workload in the civil rights, complaints, and appeals, and also 100000 in one-time funding um, for the department to address the current backlog of complaints. In our review of the workload, we believe this is justified and recommend approval. Okay, thank you. Number four. Um, the, for the fourth item, the governor's budget is providing 177,000 and 1 1.5 positions to meet the requirements of SB 949 enacted last year and establishes the Distinguished After School Health Recognition Program and requires the department to develop guidelines for how after school programs qualify for the recognition program and also um, programs achieve certification to be posted on their website. Thank you. This implements legislation passed by the legislature and signed by the governor, so we would recommend approval. Thank you. Number six. Um, or number five, five. rather. Right? I'm sorry. Um, so the, for the fifth item, the governor's budget is providing 151000 to backfill um, federal public school charter grant funding that's expected to be reduced in the budget year. So this funding would support... Um, excuse me. So respectfully, um, Senator, I, you know, it, it, unless there's, you know, negative comments, I mean, it sounds like we, we've, all, we've got the outline here. You're very ably kind of <laughs> articulating what's on the page here. I'm wondering if we could move the item, uh, you know. But. Yeah, Senator Allen, if, if that's the committee's pleasure, certainly. Um, if there, We do want to hear from members of the public Absolutely. before we move to a vote, but... And maybe we can get clarification from the panel if there are particular questions raised by public comment. Yeah, but in, in our agenda, there is pretty clear um, um, indication of what each item is and what the LAO's position is. So um, at this point, let me ask... Um, we're, we're, staff recommends that we hold open items 1 and 11 pending updated cost estimates and additional information that may revise, 1 and 11. And, 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 I, and I would just say I'd be very interested in getting uh, some more private information about number 1. I mean, it just seems a lot of money. Okay, so 1 and 11 will hold open for more information. Items 2 to 10 are recommended for approval. Now, this is, again, on page 29 of your agenda, 29 going over to page 30, items 2 to 10. If any member of the public wants to speak just on page 29 and 30, items 2 to 10, now is the time to come forward, and you'll have an opportunity to state your name, your organization, um, which of the items you wish to speak to, and you'll have a minute. So come on forward. Mr. Chairman, members, uh, Bill Lucia with that voice. Uh, we uh, concur with the holding open of item one. Uh, we uh, recommend that you consider holding it open for not just reasons of cost estimates, but for lesser than this non-prop 98 general fund cost, the state legislature- Let's stick to items two to 10, please. 
uh, two to ten. We're holding one open. We'll have a chance to have public comment on that later. At the regular public comment, is that it? Or when do we get to provide comment on number one? Because we have a different view than just updating cost estimates. Um, at the end, when we have everybody okay. else come up. This is just on items two to ten. Okay, seeing no public comment on two to ten, um, will staff please read the recommendation? And open the uh, roll. Uh, Senator Block, um, there's a couple. Oh, are you guys, I, I didn't realize you were here. Come on up. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Debbie Rice. Mm -hmm. I live in El Dorado County. Um, I'm a longtime civil servant. Um, in the last five or six years, I've been working with nonprofits um, in the Sacramento area and El Dorado County um, for education and prevention of sex trafficking. Mm -hmm. My church was real involved in um, securing signatures to put Prop 35 on the ballot. As you know, it overwhelmingly was approved into law. Um, I encourage the support of Letter seven for the hundred and thirty five thousand dollars for the um, drafting of trafficking and sexual abuse um, narrative to educate and inform our students. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate the comments. Next speaker. I'd also like to speak to item seven. Thank you. And I'm Christina Kavanaugh. I am a volunteer for California Against Slavery's policy team and its various working groups, including for this legislation. I'm also a volunteer ambassador of Hope for Shared Hope International, and we strongly support this legislation. And just a couple weeks ago, I gave a child sex trafficking workshop to University of California students that were from all over the state here for their lobby conference. And I would say they could even use this prevention education. And I'm actually from University of California, went to school there, I was recruited there. So in 40 years of the local universities, I'd say my students could use this prevention education. So I'm certainly hoping that we can offer to all of our middle school and high school students that are obviously much more vulnerable than our university students, and they're actually truly being targeted by traffickers. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you both for your comments. Uh, this item is recommended for approval, and, and I assume it will be approved. Your, your comments help. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, any further public comment? Very brief. Anybody else who wants to make public comment, come up now and you can just sit down. Go ahead. No, Thank you. Now, this is, this is just, on this on, just on this item. <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Chris Lev Twombly with the California State Alliance of YMCAs, here to voice briefly our support for item four, the Distinguished After School Health uh, Recognition Program. We think it would be a great way to um, get after school providers to start uh, incentivizing, uh, addressing obesity prevention in California. Um, and we think it would be low cost, high, high return, money well spent. So we Great, thank you. Thank you so much. Seeing no further public comment on items two through 10 um, under uh, item number seven, um, we will move to uh, the recommendation is approval of these items. Let's call the roll. This items two to ten as budgeted. Uh, Senator Block. Aye. Senator Allen. Aye. Senator Morlock. Okay, please show this item be, these items two to ten being adopted to zero one abstention. Um, we will now move to a discussion. It, well, eleven and eleven and one were holding open. So anybody who wishes to speak to item one or 11 or anything else on the agenda, we will deal with at the end of the agenda, which is now. Okay, now is the time for public comment. So please line up on any item that you wish to discuss. I will be able to stay with you for the next few minutes to hear the first several comments. Uh, I do need to be on a plane to San Diego for an obligation tonight. So um, the chair will be Senator Allen after I leave. Um, I will um, guarantee all of you, we do watch the tapes. We have available the tapes of all of these comments to listen to. And before we take action on any of the items that we didn't act on today, which are the ones you want to speak to, I will watch the tape and hear what you have to say. 
So um, again, you have one minute each. Please state your name, the organization you represent, and um, we'll begin from left to right and fill in the empty seats as they empty. So, Mr. Lucia. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Bill Lucia with that voice. I want to refer to uh, page 16 at the top, question number three. We recommend an augmentation to the department to support formative assessments. Uh, 60603M of the Education Code defines formative assessments. 60642.6 of the Education requires the department to provide tools at no cost to districts at formative assessment tools. Those are not in the uh, any of the numbers that are included here. There's talk about a digital library, but it is not formative assessment tools. It provides a, a functioning capability for teachers to type, get into an item bank get uh, information, uh, assess pupils, and, and adjust instruction, which is the definition of what formative assessments are and what the legislature directed to happen. It's not happening. There's money to do it. It should be done to help teachers help kids. On the issue that we were just addressing, uh, you all were just addressing item one of the state operations budget, we think that it's uh, uh, abhorrent for schools to herd kids into cafeterias and gyms for months at the beginning of the school year, and that it's, we're gonna spend taxpayers' money of $3.6 million, nonprofit 98, general fund money, to continue to fight litigation. This needs to be put to a stop. There needs to be a trailer bill to direct the department to notify everybody that that's not okay, and it's not okay under the Constitution. And if it's um, a question of evidence being provided, there's plenty of evidence that it exists in the plaintiff districts, but even beyond that. And the state's answer shouldn't be that equity is that, oh, well, it's done in other places too. It is not okay to leave kids un unattended and not receiving instructional services well into the school year. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Hello, my name is Grace Trujillo. I'm a parent from the Sacramento School District. My son is 14 years old. He has made tremendous strides over the years, but in order to do that, he, he relied on special education funds provided by the federal and also the general fund. I know for my son, if the behavior intervention is not put in place, my son would be in an institution. I have spent here like five, six hours. The reason I do this is if, if he doesn't have these um, services, I'm afraid for my safety and the safety of my family. So it's very important to keep, continue to keep these funds available for everybody, not but just for my son, but for the entire, because otherwise these kids are gonna end up in an institution and it's gonna cost the state a lot more money. So thank you. Thank, thank you, you for, for your time. comments and thank you for being here. Next speaker. Thank you, my name is Rich Fagan. I'm the Associate Superintendent for Finance at Elk Grove Unified School District. Um, I'm here today to talk on, on behalf of funding for our special needs students, particularly the students that are affected by autism. It uh, was discussed earlier today, it is a growing disability within our districts. Um, our districts, I'll give you some simple uh, information and my colleague, he'll give you some more specifics in a minute. Um, in 2002, we had two autism classes. We now have over 60. The bulk of those have been added over the last five to seven years. And the bulk of those come to us as three and four year olds and we receive no funding for those students for their first two years. If it was something that was a bubble in uh, the situate system, I would say we would learn to deal with it on ourselves, but it's not. It's a constant ongoing piece and it's growing exponentially. So as you look at funding uh, or look at services for students, be aware that the funding uh, mechanism was not well in the beginning and uh, before this uh, autism surge and it's getting even worse as we move forward. So I would uh, ask the committee to be familiar with it. Thank you for your comments. Next speaker. Steve Ward, uh, I represent the California School Funding Coalition and Clovis Unified, and I want to also speak to the uh, funding issue. I've brought uh, a chart, two charts for you to uh, see what is happening with the costs. The costs are rising dramatically at a rate of 4.1% every year. This is compounded. This is the 35 largest selfies across the district. Uh, it's across the state. On the back side, on the other uh, chart, this shows where the dollars are coming from. And as they said, uh, LAO said earlier, uh, it comes from the state, federal, and local. And you can see on this chart that it clearly, the local contribution is going from 35% to 43% over the last seven years. And in terms of dollars, the increase over that time was $2.2 billion. 73% um, of those cost increase were absorbed by local funds. We need to take a look at the funding formula and come up with a new way to uh, adjudicate dollars for special ed students. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'd like to thank all the speakers so far. You're all just under a minute, which is perfect. Your timing is very good. <laughs> Next speaker. 
Good afternoon. My name is Lily Chen, and I'm an education rights attorney at Public Council. We run the online resource fixschooldiscipline.org, and we also provide technical assistance to districts uh, trying to meet the state priority for school climate. Uh, right now, the demand for quality training regarding research-based alternatives like restorative justice and PBIS um, are, uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> um, are, are quickly outpacing the demand for um, trainers, or sorry, the supply of trainers. These approaches teach tolerance, eliminate bias and discrimination, and help create welcoming school environments for all students. When school districts like Los Angeles, San Francisco, and Oakland have access to quality training, it leads to dramatic increases in academic achievement, attendance and graduation rates, and decreases in suspensions and expulsions. The lasting result is safe school environments and keeping our young people healthy, happy, and in school. Thank you. 